Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of John Ocrafa. I am Noel, and joining me is a very special guest, Julie Sador. Hi, I'm Julie. I was on the previous episode of Halloween 3. I was the artist behind SnowflameComic.com, or Snowflame, the fan comic series. And you can also find my work at jsidor.tumblr.com. And we are here to discuss The Thing, specifically the 2011 Thing, not to be confused with the 1982 Thing, even though it is a prequel to the 1982 Thing. I found out, though, they actually were going to call it The Thing Begins at one point. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Or The Thing Uncovered. Mm. Yeah. Thing Resurrection. The Thing. <laughs> well, but it's not really a resurrection because it's the first thing. Incre- it's yeah. still coming out of the ice. The Thing in the Ice. I'm just slapping <laughs> on conventional colon titles. Digging up the, the thing. the beginning of The Thing. Yeah. <laughs> So, because we had previously done on Masters of Carpentry an episode on John Carpenter's The Thing, would you like to just kind of tell us, what are your thoughts on this movie? Great movie. Again, I kind of agree with what was said on the podcast that it's a masterpiece. Everybody bought their A-game, even the dog. <laughs> and Especially that dog, yeah. Yeah, that is one charming dog. As far as like suspense, selling it, bringing down to earth characters, like all of the strengths of John Carpenter are amped up to like 11 Excellent film. I had only recently seen it in the past couple of years, and again for this podcast, but previously I had known it by reputation, and it lived up to that reputation. And then also, I know recently you saw the 1950s thing from another world. I did. That one was did do some excellent things for the time. It's okay to not like it. <laughs> it just didn't completely sell all the story to me, but some of the scenes were fantastic, especially where the thing bursts in on fire just out of nowhere and is wreaking havoc in the bunks. Like that scene, it was just like crazy. Kind of say the high point of that movie. And then it also had some other really good visuals. Like it began all of them standing around and finding out that the ship is indeed saucer shaped. Like some really, really great visuals. You know, the characters do become individual and you begin to like them. And you can see how a lot of Carpenter's strengths come from the Howard Hawks movie. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good things there, but it didn't quite grab me all the way. So now, with the prequel movie, The Thing, had you ever seen it before? No, I have not. I'd seen it back when it came out in 2011, though this was my first time revisiting it. This is fun. I actually dug out my old live journal review from 2011. Oh, live journal. <laughs> yes. I haven't updated that in four years. It's still just sitting there. As are many live journals. Yes. Mm. It was interesting to revisit it, and my thoughts are pretty much exactly the same as they were back then, so that'll be interesting to discuss. So getting into a little production history, The Thing was released on October 10th, 2011 with a budget of $38 million, yet it only grossed $16.9 million domestically and $9.5 million overseas. It bombed. Ouch. John Carpenter had no involvement in this film. However, they did call him up to ask his blessing for it. He did say, go on, have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And there was actually talk about possibly getting him to cameo in it as the helicopter pilot at the end, Mm -hmm. though that just ultimately never came about. Prior to this, there was an attempt to make either a remake or sequel to the 1982 film as a miniseries on the Sci-Fi Channel. I do have the scripts for this, and we'll be covering it in a separate John Ocrafa episode that I'm going to be recording later. And as far as I can tell, there wasn't really any carryover from that project to this one. So the film is the directorial debut, and as of this recording, the lone feature film of... I have to apologize to him. It's it's Matij Mathis? Mathis von Heinegen Jr.? I'm so sorry for butchering the name. My Scandinavian ancestry is not doing me proud. He is a Dutch director who is primarily known for commercials as well as a horror short film called Red Rain, which I know won a lot of awards and was what got him this job. I haven't seen it myself. I did look up six or seven of his commercials. Probably the most prominent one, which I know got a ton of play on TV, is a PlayStation commercial with two dudes playing their way through a whole mess of video games while singing, It's such a perfect day. Okay, yeah, I remember, you remember that, that one. one? Yes. Yeah, that's him. A lot of effects-heavy commercials, a lot of action, a lot of nice, subtle humor, no horror. Mm-hmm. That is going to carry on into some comments I'm going to have in his direction. 
The script was initially by Ronald D. Moore, making his debut on The Next Generation. Moore quickly became one of the most prominent Star Trek writers, carrying on to Deep Space Nine and the initial debut of Voyager, as well as the film's Generations and First Contact. He carried on as a writer and producer on the television shows Good vs. Evil, Roswell, and Carnival, before infamously spearheading the relaunch of Battlestar Galactica. Since then, he's had a few screenplays which haven't been filmed, a few pilots which never went to series, and otherwise sticks to television with Helix and Outlander. And I am going to have things to say about Helix later. It was an interesting watch. The screenplay then went through a major rewrite by Eric Serer, who also wrote Final Destination 5 and the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, oh. before making his directorial debut in 2013 with Powers, which I think was the last starring role of Paul Walker before the new Fast 7 movie. Okay. Earlier this year, he also launched his first comic book series, Shaper, which, which looks interesting. It just came out like two months ago from Dark Horse. I'll have to check it out. New idea in the genre? Kind of a post-apocalyptic, dystopia, shapeshifter, pirate story type thing. The uh-huh, description, another one of those. The description was one of those ones where it's like a whole lot of stuff. Okay. And it'll be interesting, interesting. to see how it all holds together. I will say I did read the screenplay. I thought that I had two drafts of the script. I thought that I had Ronald D. Moore's draft too. But no, someone just took the same script and stuck different cover pages on them, which is is unfortunate in script collecting circles. It read well on paper. There were a few differences here and there. It was pretty much the shooting script, but the film actually did go through a bunch of reshoots later, adding a bunch of scenes. I'll, I'll probably get to some of those in the discussion. And I'd say the Elm Street remake is one that I actually really liked his script on paper, but the final film, eh... We've covered that on remakes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Have you seen the Elm Street remake? Mm-hmm. What do you think of it? I remember. <laughs> That's the perfectly valid response to that. <laughs> Moving on, producers Mark Abraham and Eric Newman were coming off the remake of Dawn of the Dead when Universal offered them this project. They've gone on to do a whole bunch of other stuff. Similarly, they've also gone on to do the RoboCop remake. Executive producers David Foster and Lawrence Terman were producers of the 1982 film and are the only crew returning from that version. Executive producer Gabrielle Nyman's only other credits are the Last Exorcism series. She's otherwise apparently an executive at Sony. And J. Miles Dale also worked on the Carrie remake and was also the second unit director of this movie. The creature effects for the film were done by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr., who were protégés of Stan Winston, who had been doing creatures for all of the Alien films since the second one, as well as Monster Squad, Tremors, Jumanji, Evolution, Starship Troopers, the X-Men movies, and Friday the 13th Part 4. Okay. Infamously, most of the puppets they created for the thing were replaced by digital effects without their knowledge, and they've since developed and crowdfunded an indie horror film called Harbinger Down as a new project to feature these puppets. It sounds like an interesting project. Hmm. Like, hey, we have all this stuff laying around that was never used and the thing was supposed to be used for. Let's make a movie. Sounds good. In 1982, a Norwegian camp makes a fantastic discovery in the ice of Antarctica and calls in famed scientist Dr. Sander Holverson, whose assistant Adam talks his boss into also bringing along paleobiologist Kate Lloyd. They're flown in by American helicopter pilots Sam and Derek and find the camp, led by Edvard, to be alight with drunken celebration as what they've found is a massive flying saucer dating back 100,000 years and a creature preserved in the ice nearby. A block containing the creature is hauled back to camp, where Sander and Kate begin clashing over how best to examine the discovery, and Sander also has them sever communications with the outside. It's not long before the thing bursts out of the ice and in the ensuing chaos kills and begins to eat a man before everyone defies Sander and sets it on fire. Sander becomes obsessed with examining the carcass to preserve the discovery, but the Americans want to fly out the wounded before a storm hits and Kate's continued examination reveals there's still active cellular activity in the creature and that it's able to replicate any tissue it comes in contact with. On top of this, she discovers fillings from teeth due to the thing's inability to replicate inorganic tissue, which leads her to reveal that someone on the base might be a thing as she flags the leaving chopper to land. One person on board is indeed a creature causing the helicopter to crash in the mountains. Filling the others in, Kate wants to sabotage the remaining vehicles to prevent anyone else from leaving, but when she receives help from Juliet, the other woman turns out to have also been a thing and attacks, killing another with Kate narrowly escaping. The camp is torn between those now accepting that there may be other things in their midst, including laborers and flamethrower bearers Lars and Peter, and those who feel Kate is being reactionary and jumping to conclusions, Sander, Adam, Edward, and Finch, all four of whom are separated off from the group when an examination of their mouth reveals no fillings in their teeth. Things aren't helped when Sam and Derek mysteriously hike back from their crashed helicopter and violently escape custody, snatching one of the flamethrowers and killing Peter, 
In the ensuing scuffle, Edward is revealed as another thing, his limbs scurrying off as independent creatures as his main form kills Derek and attacks and absorbs Adam, making the twisted, two-headed creature discovered in the Carpenter film. Radio Man Griggs hides away and commits suicide, Sander is attacked by the creature, and Kate and Sam kill off the limb monsters while playing cat and mouse with the Edward Adam Beast before ultimately torturing it. They then see a Sander imitation driving away toward the saucer and follow and are separated as they sneak on board. During a fight with the Sander thing, Kate takes both it and the ship out with a grenade, and she's reunited with Sam as they run out. As they're about to leave, Kate points out to Sam that he's missing his earring and sets him ablaze as well. Back at the base, a neighboring base chopper has finally arrived in answer to distress calls, but all he finds is a lone Lars amidst the smoking ruins, who orders the man to open his mouth at gunpoint. Lars's dog, which was killed earlier in the film, suddenly appears and takes off, and Lars orders the chopper in the air as they follow it along the snowy plains. Julie, do you recommend The Thing prequel? I'll recommend it if someone really likes The Thing. Otherwise, I don't know, this one's kind of a, a hard one. I think I'm going to go with no. I don't know if I want to go completely into detail yet, but there were some things that failed to grab me. And I think a lot of just all the charisma and the character of the original Thing film, it just really wasn't here. While I like some of the choices they made for the story, I just felt like it just didn't get sold. So that's what kind of makes it a little bit harder for me to recommend this one. I'm kind of hanging on the fence, but I think I'm ultimately going to side with not recommending it too. I don't think it's a bad film. I don't think it's badly made. I don't think the cast is that bad. The creature effects aren't bad. It's not a bad take on the story, but it's, as you said, it lacks charisma. And it's just kind of bland and not particularly memorable. The original film was so shocking and so memorable. And yet, while I don't hate watching this movie, I don't feel I waste my time when I'm watching it. I also don't feel compelled by it, you know? Exactly. None of the creatures, while they weren't bad creatures, they didn't shock me. Mm -hmm. The only few jumps that I got were actual just jump scares. I didn't really get any, like, horrified reactions. Like, remember that old defibrillator scene in the first? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was completely unshocked by any of it, including the scene where the alien bursts out of the ice. I'm just pretty much was deadpan in the face throughout the entirety of that. And there were moments where I was kind of taken out of the movie by the effects. There were a couple of very specific ones, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, which we can kind of discuss. But also, I had a lot of trouble telling a lot of the characters apart. Mm -hmm. To me, it was pretty much... Kate Sanders, the doctor, who he reminded me of the doctor in the 1950s thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they even gave him the same wardrobe. Exactly. And so that's kind of something for me to latch on to. And Lars, who I kind of liked the most, and I just wanted to to see a little bit more of him. He then disappears for the last part of it. He then disappears for the last part of it. Yeah. And I don't know. It was just, uh, yeah, I wasn't necessarily compelled by any of the characters. And they're not bad characters, and they're not badly cast or played, but they're just not memorable. They don't draw you in, and there's not a whole lot of differences between them. I couldn't even tell you what most of their jobs were, Mm -hmm. except for Kate and Lars and Sanders. I mean, like in the original film, everyone played a role. Everyone had a purpose at the camp. Everyone had a distinct personality. And they felt like they had personalities Mm -hmm. that kind of fit their jobs or that they would develop from working that Mm -hmm. kind of job. The sole exception, I would say, would be the pilots. They felt like pilots. They felt, you know, some of the years there wasn't in there, much but distinction not a lot. between the two characters. Just got the two pilots. At least they felt like pilots. Yeah. And Sander felt a bit like a scientist, but like otherwise it just there wasn't a lot of specificity to yeah. how their characters are fleshed out. And then even then the dynamics like, you know, Kate versus Sanders. Mm-hmm. You have Sanders versus the pilot in terms of we should destroy it, no, we should preserve it, which exactly comes from the fifties film. They don't build on that. They establish right. it, but then they don't really build it anywhere. And without strong personality personalities, it kind of doesn't really work. And we only get that scene between Kate and Sander where he's just like, don't don't contradict me mm-hmm. in front of these people ever again. You're just here for one job. You're not here to think. That's a good start. See, but then my other problem- But it never really builds. Exactly. And my other real problem is they build him instead of as a red herring antagonist. He's just, no, he is the flat-eyed antagonist to the point where he is the final monster that she has to overcome yep. at the end, <laughs> literally. With some accessories growing out of him. With some accessories growing out of him, yes. 
That's my other real problem is that it telegraphs its moves too well. It You're really never does. shocked by the reveal of any of the people as things. Mm -hmm. Like in the original, you had no idea who was going to be a thing, you know, until it showed you. And, and you felt bad when they were a thing. Or when they were a thing. You're like, you oh no. Bad. Oh no. I know. And in, in this one, they don't even set up red herrings very well mm -hmm. because they kind of want to explain everything. In yeah. the original one, it's like some things you just don't have a clue how they became a thing. And some of the direct there's parts where it's just stands so differently from the 1982 movie, even to the part where she's looking into a microscope and she's looking at cells, absorbing other cells, watching them change to mimic human cells, and then she telegraphs it too. But to be fair, the original film kind of did that badly with their time. But, but, but at oh, least yeah. in the 1950 film, I mean, there's so little that they can do as far as storytelling with the camera. That one, it's a little bit more acceptable, but with this one where they have the tech to be able to tell a story a little bit more subtly yeah. and they have such a good example of how to do it which John Carpenter's the thing that when it's kind of so see and say it's not really that acceptable yeah and it's like the thing about the director having watched all those commercials he's a good action director but directing action does not mean you can direct suspense and horror. And this is the same problem mm -hmm. I had where they got the guy who did Speed and Twister to do The Haunting. Mm -hmm. You're seeing some good direction on display, but none of it is scary because everything needs to be visible. Everything right. needs to be clear. He just doesn't know how to draw out a suspenseful beat. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know how to build this shocking punch. Right. Like, I mean, that whole bit with Edward when they're like dragging him in and then suddenly his arm slips out and yeah. then he's becoming a thing on the floor. It's like that on paper. I could see being a really nicely built sequence, but it's not scary. Yeah. You gotta like stage it. You just gotta work with that a little bit more. And it's like, even then, I can't say it's badly staged because it's not, but he's directing this like an action movie. Mm -hmm. It's a well-directed action movie. The problem is it's not supposed to be an action movie. Right. It feels much more like an action or a fantasy movie mm -hmm. than it does like a thriller. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the key there too. You yeah. can tell a thing story. I don't think he was the right person for this job, even though he visibly cared about it. And I did listen to the commentary, too. He had a lot of love for the original film and was trying his best here. I just don't think he ultimately fit right. But I will say, I like enough of his stuff that he does here that I would like to see more films from him. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious, too. His commercials were interesting. I was interested that it did try in some places to take it a bit further, where in retcon, is any of the efforts of the 1982 movie going to matter? Like, is there something that's contaminated and is going to get out? Mm -hmm. I liked that. I liked that they kind of got to the spaceship. And then some of the visuals got a little bit more creative. Initially, I wasn't terribly impressed with some of the visuals they used. And that's part of why I think I wasn't as drawn into this one. Well, I do want to say during the featurettes, you do get to see a handful of what it looked like with the original puppets on set. Mm -hmm. It's not really that much better. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were good puppets and all that. But I mean, like in that bit where like, you know, the Edward spider thing is crawling backwards with his head fully view. The puppet face looks just as fake as the CGI face. And I don't think the CGI made the designs any lesser. The only specific problems I had digitally were like rippling skin, mm -hmm. where it just looked very bad and cheesy. Right. And then that face they grafted on there at the end. Yeah. What I would say is like, at least I saw a little bit more creativity, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually care for a lot yeah. of the designs and even some of the sequences with the hand where it kind of crawls against the guy's throat. Like, it would have uh, been more shocking had they just used the hand part actually grabbing him instead of just the little sucker leech face. Yeah. I'm not really sure what would have made it better, but it is something that made me realize in retrospect how that terrible monster from mm -hmm. the 1982 film that's like a distorted mess of like limbs of like animals and humans had a charisma to it that it, it was captivating to watch. Whereas with this one, it kind of, I don't know. And then it, kind of some of the sexual overtones of it, like a little bit. Especially with Freudian, the Juliet creature. Juliet creature. When the, the two doctors origin. merge and then with the arm sort of turning almost into like one of the crabs from the aliens and like, mm -hmm. I guess keeps pumping face the color through. It's, yeah. yeah, the face huggers. It actually just made me less interested. It didn't like make it any scarier. What, may, what I think made a lot of the creature sequences in the original works so well, especially there's mainly just three main creature sequences. The others are just done really quickly. Or there's a build. Yeah. It's gradually evolving. It's gradually taking new shapes and gradually opening into new forms. 
In this one, it's just like they'll shake for a second and then just burst into their creature mm-hmm. form and then are just that creature form right? for the entirety of the sequence. That's true. There's no continuing to evolve. I mean, like the whole losing the limbs to become other creatures, that was what was nice about the head crab in the original was that it was the tail end effect at the end of the right. sequence. Instead of everything just falling out at once. And then the whole thing trying to attack them for like 20 minutes in exactly. that state. Yeah. Kind of made it less captivating. I mean, they weren't bad designs, but they looked like something you'd see in like a Silent Hill game. Oh, you know? yeah. No, yeah. They were just interesting. Oh, not even Silent Hill. I, yeah. I would say. Resident um, Evil. Hellraiser direct video. Okay. And I like some of this. It just but I mean, they're like monsters. something that you would see running around Actually, behind no, you in a stage of a video game. Isn't it like a Hellraiser 3 had the two uh, Hellraiser guys 4. merging? Hellraiser 4, Yeah, that's the two right. twins where they got together. The two twins together. get merged. Yeah. And that, that movie. A little thing like, yeah. But again, you know, those, it worked well for the Cenobites because each has a design reflecting their personality, so it stays kind of fixed and constant. With the thing, it's supposed to continue evolving. Right. And also, with Hellraiser, any kind of weird or bringing sexuality into the horror of it, that works with the themes. Mm -hmm. Here, I think when it was used, you could see a little bit too much of the author's intent, and so that kind of drew me out of it. It felt like someone was deliberately, like, poking you to be horrified, kind of by going for some low-hanging fruit, grabbing with, like, a sexual theme where it feels out of place for this monster. That's all. Yeah. See, and I think with also lacking the build, what made the thing such a threat in the original was it wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. No matter what you're throwing at it, it's continuing to... I mean, like, the dog scene is so perfect. Even as they're shooting it with fire, it's continuing to split off and things are coming out and all stuff. It just keeps getting worse. In this one, it just keeps running at you. Right. You can set on fire, it just keeps running around. It doesn't continue to be like, let's shed that layer and now another thing comes out. Right. Yeah. yeah, in the 82, they're like blasting with fire and it just keeps getting worse. And they're just like, oh, God, what now? Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly there's a mouth of dog tongues right. coming at yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, the line of the movie. You got to be fucking you kidding. You got to be fucking kidding me. Yeah. Like that, is, <laughs> that really is the I line mean, for that and, movie. And the thing is, and that was a perfect explanation for what we just saw. That exactly. You got to be fucking kidding me. This just happened. And I would not describe any of the sequences in this one. Exactly. But in the other one, I'm like, thank God he said it, because that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, oh, God. (laughs) It's the little head that's screaming. Yeah, staring out. It's like, (laughs) the original head crap. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) This also builds on my larger problem with the film is that despite labeling it a prequel, it is essentially a remake because Mm -hmm. it's following the same framework of the original. I mean, like, beat by beat by beat. really is. And I think if they had just let it be a remake, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have as much problem with it. It would still be a kind of mediocre interpretation of the story. Right. But it would still just be its own version of the story. And I would be like, it's not as good, but I'm okay with it. Right. But the problem is, by then labeling itself a prequel, you're retelling the same story as a lead-in to telling that story Mm -hmm. so it doesn't function as a prequel and that doesn't allow it to function as a remake so it kind of cancels itself out in terms of it's ultimately a pointless movie yeah, it doesn't really bring bring too yeah. much new. I almost wonder what if the movie had originally been written with the idea that they figure out what this thing is in like the first five minutes of the movie, and then everything else is just escalation and seeing where it goes. Yeah. Like they know that if it gets anywhere near any other outpost of humanity or life or God, even where the birds are nesting or whatever, that the whole planet is going to die. Yeah. All the animals in Antarctica aren't there year round. They go exactly. other places. And just trying to stop Stop that, that would be a lot more engaging. Or just pull it in some other direction. And this is where I wish they had gone back to the original story, because there's still things from that original story that have never been used. Like, in the original novella, there's a scene where a flock of albatross Mm -hmm. coming towards the camp. Exactly. And they're doing everything they can to shoot at them, to scare them away, to keep them from landing. And even then, they're worried, did we get them all? Did Did, we get them all? Did anything leave? We don't know. That would be a nice sequence to slip in. You know, and even then, with telling the story of the Norwegian camp, we don't get the scene of standing around the saucer. Yeah, we don't. Which was there in the original John Carpenter film when they're looking at the footage of the Discovery. We don't get that scene. I mean, we open with the scene of them falling through the ice cavern, which is an okay scene, but... It's not the one. It's not memorable. Yeah, I think if you're going to pull so much directly from it and so many beats, it's like, you mm-hmm. got to bring that one in. I mean, yeah, but that's still my ultimate point, is like, if this is going to tell the story before the story, why are you just telling the same story? Yeah. 
you know, and again, I don't dislike a lot of their interpretations. I actually really like the whole using the fillings instead of the blood. Oh test. yeah, I really like that twist. Because that feels like an early term. draft of what could then become a blood test because not everyone without fillings is a thing. Right. But all things are going to be without fillings. Right. Though I almost expected there to be a twist where some thing actually show a character getting transformed. And let's see a few scenes from a thing's point of view as he then goes up to a mirror and starts putting in fillings. Then we have a character that we know is a thing, mm -hmm. but that the other characters believe isn't a thing because he has the visible fillings. Right. I just think that would be an interesting way to kind of subvert the idea. And like maybe introduce that like at the halfway point and then throughout the third act. It could be. And then there's a whole other issue of where this movie kind of brings in that the things know that they are and deliberately try to sabotage the humans. Mm -hmm. And that in itself kind of takes away from the horror. And I think a scene like that would just play even more on that. Well, And then that was where the director was trying to get into in the commentary, and I don't think he fully sold this, was with like Juliet and with Edvard when they're transforming, he wanted to show horror on their face as though it's essentially like the human is still there and is now just kind of being yanked along for the ride mm -hmm. as this thing is gradually taking over their consciousness. Right. And it's like, I don't think you fully sold that. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I like the idea of they totally think that they are the person until, you know, they start changing. See, but even then, that never fully makes sense because the purpose of the thing is to get people alone mm -hmm. so that you can make more things. So in some way, they are going to know. Yeah. I mean, like even in the original with the dog, he's luring people off to the side. We're seeing other people lure people off to the mm -hmm. side. I actually like, though, that there can be ambiguity, that like there are times where the thing lets the person be in control because that allows the disguise to work better, but then there's other times where the thing usurps control. Like, it's still conscious within your conscious. Okay. And it's kind of like puppeting a person, even as it's letting them kind of just continue to be them. Okay. I could see that working. It's a complicated concept with the thing. Right. Because even in the original short story, it started to raise the idea of would a person know if they're the thing? Mm -hmm. And they never answer it. Yeah. Which I kind of like. Let's just leave that open. Yeah, yeah. Some of the questions just don't need to be answered. Mm -hmm. It is ultimately just kind of a bland movie. And again, it's like, I don't want to dislike the movie because I don't not enjoy it when I watch it. But again, I, there's not really anything I take with me. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the idea of the fillings, once they actually did the whole looking at everyone's fillings, you just get a little bit of tension, but then that ultimately doesn't go anywhere. Right. Whereas the blood test ultimately leads to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. I also do like the last scene with Sam and Kate, mm -hmm. where she torches him in the end. Yeah. I did actually watch through on this viewing, and every time she comes across him, she does look at his ear. Okay. And he's always checking for the earring. Interesting. All right. I mean, Kate is our, our lead-in character. And I don't know, do you think that she was necessarily the most effective choice for that? I don't have I'm a... liking her, but... I, I um, think it just fell victim to most of what the characters fell victim to in here is that they're underdeveloped and yeah. they're lacking dynamics. Yeah. They're lacking clear dynamics that carry your interactions through things. I don't have a problem with the character. I don't have a problem with the actress. And I don't have a problem with bringing a woman in. Mm -hmm. I just... Then in the end, when she's going around the ship with the flamethrower, right. and even that bit where she's slowly peeking around the corner, that is just taken straight from Alien. Mm -hmm. That is that exact same shot of Ripley with the flickering lights as she's looking around oh, the yeah. corner, you know? I'm sure that was intentional. She's not bad. She's just another Ripley. Yeah. And I feel kind of the same way that I think the actress did her job. And I do think it was kind of underdeveloped. And, you know, absolutely just fine that she was a woman. In fact, they steered clear of a lot of the traps that often happen with that. I think actually the only thing that I wonder that maybe could have been better is just the fact that she was brought in kind of as an outsider and as an American. And I don't know if that was necessarily to emulate in the 1950s film how there was kind of like the journalist who was kind of our way into this world. That everyone's kind of like, we don't really want him here. Uh, yeah. And then they don't trust yeah. her. I don't know. I can kind of understand why they would do that. But at the same time, I also feel like it makes it harder for her to convince anybody to like listen to her, certainly, because they don't want to listen to her about the quarantine. She can't say anything against the lead scientist. And later, the guy actually tries to use it against her of like, are you going to follow this person? 
I don't know. I kind of almost wonder if it just stagnates it because it does kind of make it it's her versus them in a way. Whereas I really liked in the 1982 one where um, they're all equal. They're kind of all equals and it makes it more interesting when, you know, they start clashing with each other to try to find leadership in this situation. Those dynamics were so much more interesting that I can kind of understand why she was brought in this way. But I feel like there's a little bit of a missed opportunity there. But I did like how she played the character. And, and this actually... You're making, and how the character is written, too. Yeah, No, you're actually making me think a lot about Eric Serra's Elm Street script, where it's like there's a lot of interesting ideas and interesting dynamics and interesting characterizations, but it's not digging into them. It's just they're kind yeah. of there, but it's not really bringing them to the fore. And, and that could have been a great movie if she is the outsider. They brought in this prominent scientist who's a fellow Homelander who they trust. Mm -hmm. And along with him comes this person who's there just because his assistant talked him into doing it because they were all college buddies. You know, and then, yeah, have it be that she doesn't fully fit in. If you really wanted to play that angle, you could even just have her be the only woman at camp. I don't ultimately get what the purpose Juliet served other than to just be another woman at camp. Yeah, I, and I kind of agree. And just because, you know, maybe uh, well, they, they wanted that for that creepy transformation. Well, we'll say there, a lady there. There was also an, an additional scene with Juliet in the script. As I said, I had the original shooting script before they did reshoots, where the Juliet thing had come to her several times pointing the finger at Lars. Okay. And was like, here's a torn, bloody boot. It's Lars's boot. Mm -hmm. You know, and all this stuff. And it was trying to suggest that because they're the two women on camp, they're kind of forming a bond. Mm -hmm. You know, they trust each other more. And of course, one of them is a thing who's just trying to play the other or lure her into being killed. Okay. By taking out those additional stages, originally the Juliet thing was supposed to be putting her on the wrong path mm -hmm. to start suspecting other people, which would create more sabotage. Instead, it's just, oh, I'll show you where the keys are and I'll instantly try to kill you. Yeah. They could have built that a bit more. Yeah. I don't know that it's the best kind of dynamic to bring in there. That was John Carpenter in his 82 one, did yeah. think about putting women in, but he, he well, didn't want that to drive any of the dynamics, sure. have that extra tension there. Sure, and I, I think that actually was a really good choice. The thing Phantom Chase is kind of built on, like, anyone could be one of these monsters. Mm -hmm. We don't know who it is. They might not even know who it is. I think it just works a little bit better when it is just a lot of people as equals. Like, I think that mm -hmm. one plays to the themes better. But there is that other place where it also becomes really scary of you have this person who thinks they're trying to save the world, but they can't do anything because nobody believes them and nobody's mm -hmm. listening to them. That works too. And I think that was the best part of how it worked in the 1950s movie because all they're arguing is going to eventually decide the fate of the world. That was interesting, but I don't know. You know, and it's like I, I worked here. I know the director specifically said he didn't want to bring romance to it. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to bring this any of no that. Point. He didn't want to bring any like rapey tension or anything like yeah, that right, to right. it, even though he kind of did with the Juliet thing. Or at right. least just a dark sexuality to that. Yeah, or it's a kind of violent sexuality to that. It kind of exploitative, but it was that yeah. on both ends. There was definitely some of that with the guy's transformations. Exactly. Too. But again, it's just, I don't see why bringing the sexuality in it. Exactly. Because I liked how in the 82 thing, like, it feels like animal, like a force it, of nature. It literally Whereas feels... Whereas this one, it feels like an author trying to scare you. Exactly. And you know, in the original, it was literally like an animal has woken up inside this person and is pushing its way out. Exactly. It's horrible. It's painful. Yes, they are moaning and writhing and all that stuff. Right. But it's because of something ripping its way out through them. Yeah. It's birthing pains. It's not an it's, orgasm. <laughs> exactly. It's very <sighs> orgasmic. Yeah. And it's just kind of, uh, it just doesn't really work. Yeah. And it's like, I get what they were going for with the movie. I don't think they fully achieved it. And the thing is, a lot of the things that I criticize in it, I can still understand why they're there. Mm -hmm. But I still wish that it had just been a little bolder, had it just go a little further. Mm -hmm. Dig into things a little more. As we were even talking about, the color palette is just so black. I mean, it's like everybody in the original had a complete wardrobe right. that was them. In this one, everyone has the same color schemes. Yeah, they so really it's like do. You can't even tell them apart from what they're dressed as. Mm -hmm. And like the Norwegians, all I remember is the dude with the big red beard. Yeah. Because he had a massive red beard. Massive red beard. <laughs> just some of the lighting, some of the visuals weren't captivating to me. Because mm -hmm. like, right. yeah, I don't necessarily want to say that it isn't well shot, but it nope. just some of the visuals well, just aren't that interesting. No, and actually, you know, about cinematography, things are decently composed and they did specifically go out to get an 80s style anamorphic lens mm -hmm. just so it would try to give it a little bit more of that feel. 
but the color scheme is very dull. Mm -hmm. So none of the characters are really, none of their distinctiveness are brought out. It's like shots are nicely composed, but they aren't lined up in a way so as to really visually structure out the narrative like a Carpenter one would. Yeah. There's even shots where they like specifically emulating Carpenter, like the close-up of the flamethrower as Lars is walking down the hallway with mm -hmm. him. You know, it's like that was a shot straight out of Carpenter, but it's not done as well as Carpenter did it. And the other thing is shaky cam. Yeah. This follows into the modern trap of every shot, no matter what you're doing, the camera is just kind of wobbly and wavery. Mm -hmm. And it's like you're not allowing the composition to just exist yeah. when you're doing that. It did seem like a lot of it was kind of blue cast and kind of dull. That was a little bit sad. Mm -hmm. Whereas like in the 82 film is actually yeah. very bright, colorful a lot of times. And just like the full like, whiteness yeah. of every time they go outside, like how yeah. bright the light is shining off the snow. Yeah. Fully shown. Oh, yeah. You get the pure white of the outdoors. And then when you're inside, everything is just kind of lit normally. People mm -hmm. are wearing yellows and greens and, and reds and, and even, browns. And even flag. when the monsters are changing, yeah. a lot of times it'll have a very warm color along with like a dark shadow. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of shows you that yeah. movie doesn't have to be like monochrome and dark to be terrifying. <laughs> I mean, that's what the, the original film, though, it built to a point where it started to pull color out. Mm -hmm. As you know, the heaters start going out. Everyone is starting right. to be bulked up. Is like, frosty. as things start to get worse Both for them. The color starts to get blue. It literally, it drains the color of their, mm -hmm. film, their humanity out of it. This one is just kind of shot that way from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. You know? And again, that's a very modern shooting style, but that's kind of one of the problems of the modern shooting style. Right. You know, you're not really digging into it. Again, it's like you're just doing it, but you're not digging into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is still a competently done film, but it's there's no stabs of, like, greatness. Mm-hmm. I will say the one, kind of the ending scene where she's fighting the monster with Sanders' face. Like, see, no, yeah. the composition of it, you burst out laughing. And I can tell you well, it's that if you storyboarded it, I think you would laugh at the same thing. Like, it just, a floating face. Like, there's certain angles that you pretty but much should never shoot a person at for a film. Yeah, no, and my main problem is just that they literally just shot the actor and put his face on the CG model. They yeah. said on the commentary that they did that last minute because it was a CGI face originally. Yeah. Like, you've already gone with CGI faces for so many of the creatures. Just go with it. Yeah. And also, I don't know why you need to highlight that to that point because it's not like he talks to her. Right. It's not like her facing down Sanders really means anything and, anymore yeah, not because really. it's not Sanders. And it's not like he's not the psychological mm -hmm. obstacle that's keeping her from learning the skills she needs to survive at exactly. all. He's just like a jerk in her way of, is she going to live? or not. Exactly. I mean, honestly, I still find the climax of the Carpenter one to be anticlimactic, too, yeah. with the fight with the big Blair mm -hmm. monster. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this one, it doesn't hurt me any worse than that one did. It's just, <laughs> it, he, he looks like, did you ever see the Lost in Space movie? Yes, I did. Do you remember when Gary Oldman yes. turned into the big bug monster at yes. the end? And they just took the photograph of Gary oh. Oldman's face on top of that snake oh, neck? No. That's what it looked like. Yeah. And it just doesn't work. I mean, the thing is, comparing the script to what they finally gave us, a lot of the additions are like, you know, the falling into the ice crevasse and the openings and extra character things. I don't disagree with anything that they've added, except that sticking the thing on the face. Yeah. Just, mm -mm. And even then, the whole idea that it's in an ice cave was also added last minute. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be more towards the surface, even though the script didn't have the whole let's just circle around it thing. Right. And it's like, I kind of get it because they wanted to just melt open the crevasse to show why it was there. But it's like, they didn't even blow up the ship. Part of the whole point in the original was they basically blew up the ship with thermite bombs. Yeah. You know, even in the John Carpenter one, they're like, those bastards blew the thing up. Yeah. It's like, but it's not blown up. Yeah. We don't end the film with it blown up. Something's left undone. See, and it's like, they try to make it such a key prequel to the original with like, gotta get the axe in the right place. We gotta get all the set things to match. That whole ending sequence with mm -hmm. Lars and the helicopter. Yet you have this massive thing that just does not line up at all. Yeah. And even the director just kind of like, eh. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you, you, if you're going to do this, you need to do this. Right. And that's, again, where I'm like, just make it a remake. Mm -hmm. Just don't even make it a prequel. Just make it a remake. I would not have hated this as a remake. I mean, I don't hate it as a prequel. I just don't get the point of it. Mm -hmm. But as a remake, I would have been perfectly fine with this. It's not the Carpenter movie. It probably still would have had all the problems that we're mentioning. Mm -hmm. But I'd still have been like, yeah, I'd watch it every few years. Catch it when it's on TV. I, I don't know that I would. So any final thoughts on the movie? think I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same here. I, again, still don't dislike the movie, but again, I'm not going to recommend it. Yeah. I don't think same here. So one thing I did want to mention just at the end here is the TV series Helix. 
which Ronald D. Moore, after he did his early draft, got attached to the Sci-Fi Channel show where it's about a virus that gets loose in the Arctic and starts doing these horrible things to people as it starts becoming this sentient thing that's trying to take over the world. And actually, when it's ripping off the thing, it's not that good of a show. It was an awful show. But then, as, I, as I've told you, it then becomes this whole thing with like a race of immortals who are trying to take over the Earth. And it just like becomes this crazy thing. There's even a character called the Scythe who just shows up in a biker helmet and two sides. Okay. Okay. But tell me that once they all fight each other and there's one left, he's going to be the king of the world. Or, or perhaps it gets some kind of vague we do, prize. We do specifically have an immortal who is decapitated and we actually find out that's not the end. Oh, okay. I don't know what the hell they're building this towards. It's not a good show. But I'm kind of engrossed with it just by how completely batshit insane it is. It was advertised as thing the TV series, essentially. Okay. All the advertisements were like people locked in the Arctic. This virus thing is on the loose. All the posters are literally like this thing ripping out of people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it doesn't do that at all. It just it just turns people into rage zombies. Okay, rage zombies. Or it's like turns most people into rage zombies and other people into immortal overlords. Immortal overlords and oh, General Scythe was it? General Katana? Oh no, he's just called Scythe. Just Scythe. Oh, come Wearing on. Wearing a motorcycle helmet, two sides. It's right there. So, but yeah, no, Helix is. It's nuts. I've only seen the first season. It's had a second season air already. Looking forward to that hitting Netflix. Check it out if you like just crazy nuttiness. Mm -hmm. But it's not the thing show that people expected going in. In its first part of the season, when it is just a thing show, it's not a very good thing show. Okay. It's only when it goes nutty that it's like, oh. Because then they just have fun with it. Gotcha. So anyways, I think that brings our episode to a close. Thank you for joining us and Julie. Thank you so much for having me. Hey everybody, I just want to sneak a little bonus review here at the end. Earlier in this episode, we mentioned that the Amalgamated Dynamics Creature Effects team, which was led by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr., were disappointed by how the puppets that they made for this movie ended up being replaced by digital effects, which inspired them to go out and create an original film in which they could showcase those puppets. Partially funded by a Kickstarter campaign and co-produced by the United Arab Emirates company Dark Dunes, Harbinger Down was released straight to video on demand on August 15th, 2015, and is currently available to watch on Netflix. Though he did direct a few segments of the television show Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction, this is the first film as both a writer and director for Alec Hillis. Now, the plot is a bit cookie-cutter. It's a group of college students and their professor are trying to track the migratory patterns of beluga whales in terms of how that's been affected by global warming. And so one of those students ends up chartering a crab fishing boat that's run by her grandfather, who's played by Lance Henriksen. While out there on a mission, they end up finding a frozen Soviet capsule, which comes from the moon, which of course ends up having some kind of a biological disease that ends up spreading among the crew. And it's very much a thing-like creature in that it infects people. It is a shape-shifting creature. Kind of one of the interesting things is that it can actually turn into a full liquid and then reform itself into a solid that actually was kind of nicely done in a few places. But it's not something where it can take over a person and appear to be that person. They cut that entirely. Once you're infected, you start to gradually degenerate into this mutation as instead of it copying your body, it's just literally feeding on your body. And it's not a very good film. I don't recommend it, but I also didn't entirely dislike it. It's actually surprisingly comparable to the prequel movie, albeit it does a few things better. I think it has better characters to a degree. They're not great characters, but they're at least more distinct. I think the cast is much more distinct. I think there's a much better visual design to the way that the film is shot. It's not very monochrome. Everyone has colors. Everyone has a very distinctive outfit, a very distinctive look. It's very easy to tell everyone apart in this movie. And there are a couple of character arcs that are quite nice. I think the editing is actually very nice. It's actually quite well shot, given the low budget. It's a very fine-looking movie. I think Gillis actually does a pretty good job directing it. Unfortunately, it just... God, the script is awful. The script is... It's as by-the-numbers and as basic and as rushed as your average sci-fi movie. The plot is just very loosely constructed. Things just kind of randomly happen. What character arcs and dynamics there are are just kind of thrown in randomly. It's not very well done, and the dialogue is awful. I mean, just, just any time the characters are sitting there trying to work out banter, 
There's a few bits that feel like they're improvised by the cast that are actually quite nice, but for the most part, the dialogue is just really choppy and stodgy and stale and just, it's not good. And most of the cast, unfortunately, is just not quite up to making up for that dialogue. And, you know, the cast, it's a very low budget cast. It's, it's kind of a, uh, these are the best people we could find cast. They're not terrible. They're not terrible, but again, they just, they weren't good enough to save the material with the exception of Lance Henriksen. And Lance Henriksen, he's one of those guys who, for every film that he's great in, you get nine films where he just kind of showed up for a few hours and phoned it in for a paycheck. This is not one of those cases. This is a film where he's actually involved throughout the entirety of the movie. He has a good character. He really gets into the role. He has some really good moments in there. The, the woman playing his granddaughter, not that great, but you could actually feel the nice genuine connection between the two of them. And he brought a lot of heart to the movie just through his performance. And so I'd enjoy him being here. And I think, though, unfortunately, the big problem with the movie and, and you know, the big reason why this movie exists was to kind of be like a statement, a kind of reaction to the thing prequel of they ruined our work and their film fell apart. So we're going to take all that hard work and try to show how you can actually make a really good, scary movie out of it. And they didn't really succeed. I had my criticisms, as you can hear earlier in the episode about the thing prequel, but there was still a degree of inventiveness to a lot of the creatures, to a lot of the design of the creatures. And you don't see that here. I know that one of the original reasons for making this movie was so they could make use of the puppets that they had built for the Thing prequel, but I didn't recognize any of the puppets from the Thing prequel, so I'm wondering if there was a legal reason why they couldn't use something that was built for one movie in this movie, like they couldn't recycle something. Like, except for one giant pair of gnashing teeth, that was about all I recognized. Everything else just looks like a big, fleshy hand puppet. And for as prestigious as Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. are, and how this film was designed to be a showcase for practical effects and practical puppeting work, it just does not come across. It just doesn't work. I mean, it's not that the creatures are bad. They're just boring. There's not much there. And literally everything just looks like a hand puppet. You can just see an arm with some fleshy rubber at the end. There's a giant monster that pops up at the end and the music swells and it's supposed to be this big epic moment, but it's just a giant hand puppet. Kind of like your typical sandworm from Doom, but not even that good with some tentacles in reverse action. And one of the other big things is this was all supposed to be about, oh, it's all practical. We don't have any digital. There's actually quite a bit of digital in there. I mean, yeah, they used actual practical stuff on set, but there's quite a few bits where they use digital to manipulate and alter the practical effects themselves. There's ways that things are composited digitally that are not very good. And it just, unfortunately, a lot of the sequences involving the creation are just they're unmemorable in a way that's different from the prequel movie but they're still unmemorable i, I think the best one was the first one where it's kind of like a play on the chest burster sequence where a guy first bursts into a creature or these giant tubes burst out of his back and start spraying infected ooze everywhere that one was pretty nice but then it just kind of ended abruptly it happened and instead of being like the chest burster scene where it just keeps going or the great scene in the carpenter thing where the thing bursts out of his chest and it just keeps building and building it just kind of like boom and there's a neat shot in there and then it's done and it's just everything just uses away and it's unfortunate and then there's another scene where you actually do have the body of a woman who's been infected and it's like she's oddly altered in that she kind of looks like you know those masked figures that you would have on the front of old sailing ships. And then as she tips down, you reveal that her face is actually the chin of this giant mouth that opens. And it's like an interesting idea, but the way that it's implemented, it looks very rubbery. The face looks very much like a mannequin. And then again, once the mouth is there, it's a hand puppet. And the reason I, I'm disappointed by the hand puppet is that the sculpts are so loose or just flesh. The creatures are just flesh. There's nothing to them. There's no actual design to them. They're just a bunch of fleshy mass with some teeth and that's it. For something that's supposed to be a statement about the superiority of practical effects, this is not really a success at implementing that. And the ultimate thing is it's not a better movie than the Thing prequel movie, to the point where I would actually, if I had to pick, I don't think either one of them is a great movie. If I ever had a friend over, I would never pull either one of these down. But if I had to pick between the two, I'd go with the Thing prequel. Harbinger Down is just, I appreciate the effort. I would like to see Gillis direct again in the future. I think he actually did a pretty good job here. The people who shot and edited it actually did a really good job. I'd like to see them continue on to do some good work. But there's nothing all that particularly memorable or striking about this movie. There's no real reason why one needs to see this movie. 
I mean, it is interesting from a historical perspective, given what happened with the Thing, but since they aren't even really using any of the puppets from the Thing prequel, it kind of then defeats the purpose of this being a curiosity of, oh, they're going to take all those puppets that we didn't get to see and they're going to use them here, but they didn't. You know, and I did watch all the behind the scenes features that they have on the YouTube station that you have on the DVD, where you can see the creature effects that they designed pretty well, and none of those are here. So I'm not really sure what the ultimate point was other than we'll use that as a selling point to raise money and then we'll just make a generic Monsters on a Ship movie. Because, I mean, this movie reminds me a lot of, there was that 1999 movie Virus starring Jamie Lee Curtis or the 80s movie Leviathan, which, you know, had a creature designed by Stan Winston and it was just a kind of lumpy flesh beast and some hand puppets. And it's just, it's a letdown. To have this kind of hope that, you know, they would try to kind of make up for the uh, thing prequel or try to counter or or do a reactionary statement of, you know, we're going to show you up thing prequel movie. And this is not really a successful way to do it. So I don't really recommend it. If you like sci-fi movies and you want just a kind of generic monster movie to throw on, go for it. But don't watch it because of the curiosity because... None of that really ended up making it to screen, so I'm not really entirely sure what the ultimate point of the movie was in the end. So, that's about all I have to add. Thank you again to Julie for having joined me earlier in the episode, and we'll be back soon with another special episode looking at The Thing. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>